My brothers and sisters, welcome back to episode 14 of Decently Indecent. I'm just settling in here, um, getting ready to pour a little bit of a nieho, as is tradition, glass resting on my laptop. Listen, today we're going to be chatting a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about toxic traits, and that sounds a little bit basic bitchy when I say it like that, but uh, allow me to explain. Uh, and hold on a second. There we go. Uh, still on the Suavecito that was given to me by my friend Zach, who was on the podcast uh, many weeks ago. And that is an 86. Fully enjoyed and fully gone. I've only drank it on this podcast, so it's been put to good use. So here's the deal, though. All right. What I want to dive into today, let me give you a little introduction. All right. Those of you listening, those of you watching... It means the world to me. Thank you for being here. I I consider this like my little pocket, you know, my little pocket of content that I can that I can do. That's just a little bit different than what I've done for years. Allows me to unwind, get a little bit real for a minute. Anyways, I consider myself a pretty well-rounded individual, you know. And honestly, I'm not really an expert at anything. But I'm pretty good at a lot of stuff, jack of all trades, so to speak. And that's worked out okay for me in my 39 years of life. Now 39 years. I just had a birthday less than a week ago. I have one more year left uh, of living until I turn 40. And from what I hear through the grapevine, um, that's pretty much when life is over. No, I'm actually I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to 40, to be honest. I'm coping. I'm not. I'm coping. I'm getting old. It's fine. It is what it is. I think that's like, I. it's really about how you decide to age. Are you a fine wine or are you 2% milk in the sun, right? That comes down to our daily decisions. Working on that, doing my best. Anyways, that's worked out okay for me. Jack of all trades in my 39 years. But everyone has a particular set of demons they struggle with. You know, nobody's immune to the throes of human imperfections. And I want to chat about a few of mine today, right? Now, fair warning, this is a bit gay, and not in the offensive way, just in the way that I'm not a huge fan of feelings talks, in wallowing in, you know, your imperfections, et cetera, talking, you know, pretending like the internet's your therapist, blah, 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 it's fucking cringe. I don't think there's value in doing that on a regular basis. However, I think sometimes it can be beneficial to explore you know, what the fuck is going on in our heads? We kind of just go day to day coasting through it. And a lot of people uh, don't stop to take inventory of, of you know, what the fuck is going on. And sometimes it makes sense to do that. So I typically prefer employing the masculine trait of saying it's fine and stuffing any feelings in a dark black box that live just that, <laughs> that lives just outside my soul, behind my pancreas, northwest of my gallbladder. But if you're going to do a podcast, you might as well try talking once in a while. So here we are. I, I, I found a list of toxic traits. And I'm happy to say after looking through it, I'm doing pretty good, honestly. I, you know, sometimes the negative self-talk gets a hold of you, really makes you think you're a piece of shit. When if you look at the zoomed out view, it's like, you know, you're doing all right. But here's a couple, here's a little rundown of a couple of the popular ones. According to, I don't, this is probably like Google top result. Who am I kidding? How much research did I really do? Anyways, <laughs> manipulation, gaslighting, dishonesty, blaming, entitlement, the worst one. <laughs> it's in half of the titles of my YouTube videos, just roasting entitled broads and dudes. Narcissism, gossiping, lack of boundaries, passive aggressive behavior, selfishness, jealousy, lack of empathy, playing the victim, dramatic Lack of support, criticism, negativity, controlling, judgmental, arrogance, abusive relationships, dishonest, lying, cynicism. Now, that's a lot of shit on that list. And I like to think as a reasonably well-adjusted individual, reasonably well-adjusted 39-year-old, I don't fall into most of those categories. Granted, we all struggle with those things individually from time to time. But I feel like in order to consider something a toxic trait, it would need to be something that 
other people in your life might use as a descriptor for your personality, you know? Like if you're that person that always plays the victim and like the people in your life talk about that when you're not around, that that's a toxic trait. <laughs> and that fucking sucks. I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> but like, you know, selfish jealousy, like everyone gets jealous from time to time, but everyone knows there's those people that are like, oh, that, you know, you don't date that bitch. She's a jealous one. You know, it's just never going to, that's just maybe who they are. Maybe they'll be able to change. Maybe they can't. But one that particularly sticks out to me is lack of empathy, which I would call apathy. Being apathetic, I think it's common. I think it's becoming more and more common these days. Apathy, which is essentially the antonym of empathy. And I want to talk a little bit about that and how it affects my life, particularly in my line of work in the years I've spent on YouTube watching all sorts of content, most of it stuff that, you know, makes me f makes the outlook a little bleak and also the double-sided nature of it and this idea that apathy can almost be a defense mechanism and necessary sometimes i think in the present day age of digital information so if i'm being honest i was kind of crushing that list that that google list i'm sure there's you know we'll get to a couple other ones later on in this so stay tuned but uh this was a, a definition just to just to give us perspective here Empathy, sympathy, apathy. These are all kind of in the same camp. Empathy and ap excuse me, empathy and sympathy is always easy to confuse. All right. So here's a here's a popular a popular passage to describe these to give us context, right? Empathy is having the ability to understand what another person experiences from their point of view. There are actually three types of empathy, but in some cases, people experiencing empathy actually go beyond understanding another's experience and can actually feel it. It's like sympathy on steroids. When you see something and you feel bad, not only feel bad, but it touches you to your core and you almost can feel the pain of being in that person's shoes in a way. Sympathy is when someone shares feelings of sadness for another person's misfortune. While someone with empathy may feel sympathy for a friend, it's not necessary for these feelings to overlap. For instance, a person can have sympathy for a friend who lost a loved one, but have no idea what the experience is like, but they do know their friend is sad. Conversely, a person could be super empathetic and not feel sympathy for someone who is experiencing a hard time. A little bit of overlap going on there. Whew, let me add a little bit of... I got this jalapeno lime seltzer. Jalapeno citrus margarita polar seltzer. Absolutely phenomenal pairing with a little bit of tequila. Just cuts the, you know, cuts the harshness just a touch. Oh, God, that's good. Lastly, apathy is a complete lack of feeling or concern for something or someone. It's not malicious or angry. Rather, it's complete indifference. Perhaps a numbness to a situation. As such, apathy and sympathy cannot coexist. However... Empathy and apathy could, because a person could understand another person's experiences and simply not care. With those definitions, I think apathy a lot of times has a negative connotation. This idea that being indifferent or just, you know, seeing something and not feeling bad for it, you know, watching something tragic or bad happen to someone else and not having a bleeding heart could be considered callous, apathetic, right? But I truly, I, I really think in the present climate of the information age, apathy is a double-edged sword. And I'll get to what I mean by that in a second. But I think with the this proliferation of social media and just, you know, the dot-com boom in the 2000s into the internet era now with our phones in our pockets where we currently have access to an endless amount of information a finger tap away at all times, 24 hours a day, living in our pockets or in our hands. This is something unprecedented in the history of humanity. And I think for a lot of people who are, you know, who have a propensity for empathy or sympathy, who feel, you know, who see pain and anguish and suffering in other people, those types, those types really struggle, I think, with this overload of information and have to be very judicious with what they allow themselves to consume. Because 
empathy is a finite resource, you know? It's it's a, it's a well with water. It's not bottomless. I consider myself traditionally an empathetic person, a sympathetic person who can see other people going through hardship and struggle and want for them to find a solution and want to do something that might be able to help them relieve themselves of their particular situation, causing them pain or harm or offer them condolences if they're going through some sort of emotional loss. But I think over the last decade, I've become so much more apathetic to a lot of the goings on in the world. And I, part of me feels like that's negative, but on the flip side of that, I feel like it is a defense mechanism. And I think there's almost a level of necessity to it, especially speaking for myself here, for someone who, you know, spends a lot of time online, the term, the term being chronically online probably defines me pretty well. Obviously, you guys know I've been doing this YouTube thing for quite a long time now, which requires a lot of my attention to be online. And outside of what I do for the business and the work side of making content, I'm also susceptible to the dopamine hits of just pulling up fucking Instagram and Twitter or whatever else. I unfortunately am most susceptible to Twitter. I find myself on Twitter slash X all the time. I don't know why. It's just always been that way since 2016, 17. That's where I initially found a community in the commentary space, like back before I had any YouTube subscribers and I was making Twitter videos. That was kind of my my start for content making that actually found an audience in 2015, 16. And then I parlayed that into YouTube and that started to grow, et cetera. But all that's to say that, you know, it's been six, eight, oh, Jesus, six, seven. No, it's closer to a decade now that I've been in this industry. And it, it, it requires you to spend a lot of time consuming content. And so much of it is bleak. Not only in the content you consume, but there is this, there is this uh, human affinity for bleakness and the uh, outliers, right? Whether it's watching shit about pedophile hunters or talking about the Instagrammer fucking with people in public to try and get some clout. It's like, it just, it just seems like everywhere you look, for whatever reason, human nature gravitates towards shit that is bleak and makes you angry. It elicits an emotional reaction. And we can, I, and like as viewers, you know, I notice, I notice this in my own content when I'm like doing a body cam video or something, it's easy to gravitate and come together around a, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, shared disdain for said individual or a certain situation. And after so many years, you're just consuming this, you're consuming it all the time over and over for me making content about it. And then when I'm not creating content about it, consuming it, it, uh, if you don't create, or if you don't manifest some sort of apathetic shield, it completely fucking drains you. And so, you know, I look at it this way, empathy and sympathy are important for any, any human individual that's not sociopathic, right? You need these qualities, <laughs> but as I said previously, they're finite resources and those resources need to be saved and protected for the people in your life that matter to you most, family, friends, coworkers. And if you are the type of personality that has trouble safeguarding these resources and you're constantly consuming content of People dying, tragedies all over the world. This thing happened in Gaza. This thing happened in fucking China. This tragedy happened in there. The school shooting there. The school shooting there. You know what I mean? Like, it's never ending. It will completely ravage your ability to be there emotionally for the people in your life that actually fucking matter. And that's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about the last couple of years, but more so recently. Because I notice that I get to a point sometimes when I've been consuming or creating or just kind of terminally online, quote unquote, for too long where I've become, you know, <clears throat> it's drained my resources. And, and and this goes back to me saying like, 
Apathy is almost a, def a self-defense mechanism now for me. I have to be apathetic to a lot of pain and anguish in the world so I can conserve my empathy and sympathy and my emotional reserves for my family and the people in my life that matter. And that is, that is something I've had to deal with and struggle with. And I think that some people probably have a harder time than others. On that same note, I think there's there's individuals maybe of, of younger generations, of course, from in internet years, I'm fucking ancient, I'm prehistoric. Kids that grew up in this age, you know, kids that are, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 with cell phones and they already have access to the, you know, every single negative thing happening at all time, just pumping into their brains during their developmental years. It's no wonder why there's an overall feeling of indifference, right? It just, it, it's no wonder. There's just no, like, it, unless you are incredibly protective of what's being pumped into your brain, it's just, it's going to be a natural progression. So you see these kids that grow up on Reddit and 4chan, and by the time they're teenagers or early 20s, it's like they don't have a single fucking feeling or care or shred of empathy or sympathy in their body for anything. How could you? <laughs> how, how could you? You'd be fucking dead, completely depleted. You have to be apathetic to survive almost. And this is new in the last 20 years. It was never like this before. When I was growing up in the 90s, it was like this: the five o'clock news was the only time you'd occasionally see like a story of like, Oh, some dude got hit by a car on the freeway and there was a burglary at the 7-Eleven in Melrose. That sucks. And then you're just back to living your life, playing video games, hanging out with your friends. Like we live in a culture now where just the worst possible shit is being pumped. I mean, fucking cold pressed, DDT'd, fucking dry fucked into our skull 24-7 <laughs> <laughs> to put it, to put it. To put it bluntly, and uh, I think that has a dramatic effect on the human condition, on our overall mental health, our feelings of well-being. There, there's a lot, you know, some people can handle it better than others, but I, I think it's talked about. I think we all kind of know it, but we're all slowly adapting at the same time. You know, it's like it's unrealistic to just be like, oh, well, just don't use the internet or don't use your phone. It's like, no, man, like you can't exist really in the modern world without some sort of connectedness. But it's something that I think about a lot as a father and a husband and somebody who really values wanting to have emotional resources left for the people in my life that matter most to me. And in a career where I'm constantly consuming things that would try and take those resources away. So I spend a lot of time, you know, I, I'm lying. I don't spend enough time being judicious about how I Oh, I do that. I, I should, I, you know, I, something I have done recently is like on X, for instance, you know, there's always those accounts, whatever the fucking algorithm is on there. It's constantly just promoting the worst shit possible. It's like somebody gets, I scroll down my feed. It's like someone's getting killed. And then there's like some political indifference and all these other things. And I'm just, I'm constantly like clicking the three dots and being like, not interested, show less of this content, not interested. I feel like I'm like, I feel like a fucking salmon swimming upstream, dude. It's like, no matter how many times I click on interested the next day, it's like a tweet from non-aesthetic things, Twitter account. It's like, oh, here's this school fight where one kid gets the living pulp beat out of him by 13 kids. And it's like, Jesus Christ, man, can I just catch a break? And it, it, certainly it's my own fault. Like, yeah, you can unplug, but again, the drama men and all that bullshit. So, I don't know how this circles back around to toxic trait because I know apathy and lack of empathy comes up on a lot of like toxic trait lists. And I think my, I certainly, that is something that I, I possess. I've, I've, I've manifested, I don't know, manifest is probably not the, the right word. I've adopted or grown a certain level of apathy, I think out of necessity in self-defense to protect my empathy and my sympathy for the people that need it. And I think about this this a lot because like my my mother who um you know you guys obviously don't know her, but she's I would I would consider her one of the most empathetic people in the world. Like she she is just a bleeding heart, cares so deeply, so, so deeply for people and humans. It doesn't matter who you are. And I think about like, man, if she was subjected 
to the shit that I see on a regular basis, like it would ruin her, you know? And it's like, there's this beautiful innocence to that. I just think the flip side of that is some of these, some of these kids, some of these young bucks and not even kids, just people of all age who spend so much time just consuming the darkest shit. And you know, it's, it's, it's considered a hobby and there's communities around it. You know, there's, there's horror communities and there's whole communities around people that just watch the most gruesome, darkest, evil, satanic videos on the internet just to watch them, talk about them as some sort of form of entertainment. And that fucking, that's, that to me is a little fucked up. But on the flip side of that too, you know, I, I know a lot of guys in the military, I think like military guys, guys that have been in, in real life situations that require you to compartmentalize and be apathetic to very stressful and horrible uh, situations. Again, there's an element to that that makes sense. I think that's why a lot of military humor is so dark, right? There's like this kind of the running joke, uh, at least with some of my some of my friends from Texas and these guys that are that are ex, that are vets um, and have done tours overseas and been in gunfights and spent time in battle. It's like you. It's a defense mechanism. You you have to be apathetic. You have to adopt this sense of dark humor because it's a way to. I think it's a way to cope in a sense. Um, and that's not a bad thing. So I think it depends on who you are in a lot of ways. And maybe what your profession is, I think there's probably a balance between being, you know, you don't want to be the person that's totally lives in a bubble and protected and doesn't understand the realities of the world. But at the same time, I think there's uh, the other end, you know, the other side of that coin where it can almost be too much, where if you're constantly willingly consuming it and letting it, take up a lot of your brain waves and your mind space, uh, it can affect you in a way that might inhibit you being there emotionally or, or even intellectually for the people in your life that truly matter. So that's apathy, lack of empathy. Uh, <laughs> something that, that's been on my mind. Another particular toxic trait, moving on to one that wasn't on that list, uh, this is self-sabotage. I don't know if I want to call it a toxic trait as much as something that Every, I feel like most people um, wrestle with this to varying degrees. Another definition from the internet from psychology today, self-sabotage is behavior is said to be self-sabotaging when it creates problems in daily life and interferes with long-standing goals. The most common self-sabotaging behaviors include procrastination, self-medication with drugs or alcohol, comfort eating, and forms of self-injury such as cutting. That last one, obviously a little more extreme. I would say that self-medicating with drugs, alcohol, and food is probably the biggest one on a large scale that people struggle with. Um, I think there's professional self-sabotage. Some people that start to find a level of success professionally might not feel worthy or whatever it is, and they, they find ways to inhibit their growth as things start to grow for whatever reason. And there's a lot of probably deep psychological reasons why humans have a tendency to do this. I know in my life, the ones I struggle with the most are, you know, dietary and health um, self-sabotage. I think this one is, it's no secret that this is obviously a, <laughs> a bit of a pandemic <laughs> globally, if not mostly in the United States with just health and obesity in general. Um, I think professionally, even with YouTube in my life, I think I've, there's been periods where I've, I've had a lot of momentum and logically understood how to continue that momentum. But instead of leaning into it, I've gone in the other direction and kind of ghosted out of this irrational fear that I won't be able to recreate a particular success or even more so that I don't feel worthy or deserving of any sort of success. I, that's something I struggle with constantly. I know imposter syndrome is kind of the pot popular term i don't like i feel like imposter syndromes it's almost like the opposite of entitlement you know it's like entitlement you often see with a lot of people that come from privileged backgrounds and had a lot of things handed to them and there's i think not many things more universally despised than people that are entitled and the flip side of that is people that have imposter syndrome or people that actually put work in and treat people well but 
still don't feel deserving of good things happening to them. Something I, I've struggled with over my tenure as a, as a YouTuber, just in general. I don't know exactly why that is, but um, I know procrastination is like probably one of the things that I struggle with the most professionally. And this is, you know, procrastination as a form of self-sabotage is, I think procrastination is something that people deal with no matter what. It's not always in a way that is like purposely trying to sabotage. It's just distractedness. It's the fact that we have at our disposal at all, at our disposal at all times, like 6,000 different things vying for our attention between our phones and our laptops and our TVs and our, you know, whatever it is. But there is a very particular type of procrastination where it's like, you know, it needs to be done. There's a deadline. You need to do it. And it's like the inertia it takes to make that first step feels absolutely monumental. I go through cycles of this where it waxes and wanes. Recently, I've been in a waxing phase where it's like some weeks it is just seemingly impossible to do the simplest fucking shit. And I know psychologically, like if you were to talk to some sort of psychotherapist, it's like there's some probably deep-seated fucking reasons why you're not willing to do this. And like, I don't I don't know about all that fucking psycho babble or whatever, but eventually it gets to a point where it's like it, it just needs to get done. So oftentimes what that looks like for me is... I'll put something off, put something off, put something off that needs to be done. And it gets to a point where I will have to completely disrupt my schedule in a way that allows me to get it done, whether that's like staying up way later than I normally would like to because I've just put it off so long. And now it's like, well, it needs to be done. There's a deadline and it's fucking 1 a.m. I guess I should start now. If only I didn't waste eight hours today doing fucking nothing or like sitting around waiting to start, just fucking tooling around on the internet. It's like, oh man, it's so fucking dumb. Like it's the human brain, man, is just so adept at making things harder than they should be. And I don't quite understand why, because oftentimes, I mean, in general, in life, a lot of things can be very black and white. There's if you work backwards, there's outcome. What do I want the outcome to be? You figure out the steps you need to take to get the desired outcome. And then you execute on those steps, right? That sounds pretty simple. And it's not to say it like sometimes it takes repeated attempts of doing the same thing. Same, you know, you want this outcome. The required steps are doing this particular thing over and over and over. And then... That's how you get the outcome. And for some reason, I mean, you know what to do, but you just can't bring yourself to do it. And, you know, I, I'm talk, speaking from my own experience and YouTube, I think as, as much as I do procrastinate and I have a very uh, fucked schedule oftentimes, not as bad as I used to be. God damn, in my first like couple of years, super sporadic. But the one thing I was decent at was at least like just the system of like, here's an outcome I want, here's what I think it will take to get there and then just executing and make sure I do that. For me, for years, it was just like, all right, I don't know what the fuck my niche is. I don't know what videos I'm gonna make, but I'm gonna make one video a week. And there was, year, and, and I did that for years. And you know, it, and, it, that, and that, was the, that was the only reason I was ever, able to have, it's the only reason why I'm in the position I'm at now, which is like just having a YouTube channel, I can make videos and people watch it, which is crazy. But that was never because I was getting immediate good feedback. It's like, oh, this is the right thing to do. It was in my head. I was like, all right, my, the outcome that I want is to be able to leave the restaurant industry and, and make a career for myself online somehow. It wasn't even that. My, the outcome I wanted was to make my first dollar on the internet. Something that wasn't me trading my time for money from an employer. And I knew the only way to get there was consistency over time. And I said, okay, one one upload a week. And and that was it. So even in the times where it was like, 
week after week after week after week after week after week, nothing, 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 nothing. I was like, all right, just keep going. And that was, and that was it. So in the midst of that was a lot of micro procrastination. But I think that ultimately I, I was able to leverage kind of just the reverse engineering of knowing what, what the system needed and, and being able to come out with the output to come to a certain uh, outcome. And, you know, I think in any industry, whatever it is, I, people struggle with procrastination for whatever reason. Most of the time, it's obviously when you're doing stuff that you don't really want to do or you're not inspired to do, but it needs to be done. This happens oftentimes with employers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's, a, there's another piece of this too, though, that is like this kind of dopamine sickness, I think, that we get excuse me, not that I think that we get, that is a result of just the modern day living technology, um, cell phones, porn, television, movies, just constant video games, highly, you know, low effort, high dopamine releasing activities, um, constantly just pounding our brains and resetting the space line. So when you have to sit and focus and do something that takes a longer time frame, a lot of work doing something that's not immediately gratifying, that can be very hard to do when we're so used to constantly stimulating ourselves with uh, easy gratification. And so all of these things kind of create this formula uh, that makes it difficult to do deep work, that makes it difficult to sit down and do productive work that will get us to a place that produces the outcome we want. Self-sabotage comes in many different forms. I think, you know, being overly critical, kind of the negative self-talk is a form of self-sabotage. I was curious. I was I was listening to a Sam Harris book on tape. He's a he's a bit of a philosopher, this guy. But he has a lot of very esoteric takes on consciousness and, you know, the state of consciousness. What is consciousness? This idea that we have this voice inside of our head, like consciousness is just our awareness of our own being to some to some respects and it is fucking crazy when you think about it first of all i've also read on this topic that there are people that don't have that don't have this like voice in their head there are people that go throughout their days without this kind of narrator talking to them which to me is crazy i'm curious what you guys think if you if you fucking if you're listening or watching comment or scream into the ether about it I thought that was just like normal, the normal human condition. Having this kind of critic constantly in your head telling you you're not, you know, in some cases you're not good enough, you're a piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. It's this self-talk. And, you know, you see these memes online about like empowering self-talk and, talk, you know, looking in the mirror and telling yourself you're enough, all this stuff. And it's, it's a little bit frou-frou and a little bit, a little bit much for me, but I'm not going to deny that there is some legitimacy to the way you treat yourself has a direct consequence on your outcomes. And this might be one of the most, ba you know, and this is something I struggle with all the time. But I think this is pretty ubiquitous. I think most people struggle with being overcritical of themselves versus how other people might treat them. And it's like, you know, the saying of like, treat treat others how you would want to be treated, right? That's always the popular saying. And then there's the flip side of that. It's like, you need to start treating yourself how you want others to treat you. And it is it is interesting how negative we can be on ourselves and how over, overly critical we can be and how that can have such a negative impact on our lives and stop us from doing things that we know we can do or should be doing because we've just convinced ourselves that we're not good enough or something like that. I don't really know how to train that. I've tried, you know, having, I think having self-awareness around it is the first step. Really realizing those moments when you're in this kind of spiral of just kicking yourself while you're down and trying to reframe that. I don't know what exactly that looks like. I'm not the best at it, but I think there is probably a benefit to being able to stop that in its tracks and turning that around. And I think that's just another example of this kind of self-sabotage people that, you know, just the smallest mistakes. This probably happens a lot, you know, the, the, 
speaking, you know, in the context of diets or like trying to get in shape, this is the all or nothing mentality where, you know, you could, you're, you're crushing it for two or three weeks and you're perfectly strict. You haven't missed a, haven't missed a macro. And then you have one fuck up on one cheat day and you're so hard on yourself because you've fucked it up and failed. It just derails the whole thing. When the alternative could be, hey, you know what? I know this is going to happen. It's going to happen a lot. And all I need to do is give myself a pass. Say, you know what? You've been doing a good job. Keep up the good work and get right back to it. It's not a big deal. But so many people, it's just like you have that one little failure and it catapults you into this fucking spiral that just ruins it. And it's like, why Why do humans have such a propensity for that? It doesn't make sense. We're like our own worst enemy. We truly are. And people that find a way to master that, I think there's two ways. You can either find a way to master it or there's the opposite side of that, which is like just this complete ignorance is bliss to where it's like, you just don't give a fuck. Some people just either don't have that voice or they just are so blissfully ignorant to that voice that they don't care at all. But I think the majority of people are sensitive to that voice and are helpless in being able to reel that voice in. So we're just in this constant loop of fucking beating ourselves down when over things that really aren't that bad. And I think that's something to think about. I don't know how to solve it, but I think being aware of it is the first step and finding a way to fucking, I don't know, Google it. <laughs> just kidding. Don't do that. It's, it's duckduckgo.com not sponsored. <laughs> uh, perfectionism. That's honestly never been a problem for me. I know it is for some people. I am happy to just put things out uncompleted or not that good and just see what happens. Build as you go. Fear commitment, never been a problem for me. Substance abuse. I mean, Jesus, that's a whole nother episode on its own. I've been fortunate enough to not struggle with dependency on particular substances. You guys that watch me or listen to me know that I enjoy uh, a little bit of alcohol. Um, Obviously, I've, I've, weed, THC, I've spent, you know, I've, thousands of times, various, I've been high various times. What the fuck am I trying to say? Figure out your words, you bitch. Let me get another sip of this tequila. Alcohol is something I enjoy uh, recreationally, socially. Weed is something that I've uh, enjoyed thousands of times throughout my life probably, but as I've gotten older, it's affected me in a way that I don't like at all. So I just avoid it. I have no problem doing that. Alcohol, I have no problem typically being moderate and not letting it affect my life, my life negatively, i.e. self-sabotaging through abuse. Uh, the worst one for me has always been food. That's been my emotional latch. Uh, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm feeling uh, down or depressed, it's like that is... That is where I go. I go to the mindless couch eating, snacking. I'm not even hungry. I'm just pounding snack food. Finish a box of cheeses. Put that away. What's the next thing? Ice cream. What's the next thing? You know that. That for me has always been my my comfort, my cope. And I think when it comes to things you're going to binge on and cope with, food is probably better than like crack <laughs> or booze at a liter a day. But even then, I've obviously been able to mitigate the damages from that by self-awareness and just understanding when it's time to, you know, try and turn things around. And obviously with food, you can, you can exercise and live healthy. There's a million different reasons, but there's varying levels of degree or degrees to the severity of these dependencies of these self-sabotage. And I don't, you know, I can't speak to some people that really struggle with these, these, these escape mechanisms to a level where it really ruins their life, whether that's through substance abuse or morbid obesity or whatever else it might be. But these things are real, man. They're present in everybody's life. I think I don't know why some people deal with it more than other. I think a lot of emotional trauma for some people kind of manifests into these escapisms, whatever that may be. But um, I got a list here, uh, and I'm curious just to look through it. This is uh, a few more. This is from scienceofpeople.com. This is a few more. Uh, toxic personality traits. So far, I've talked mostly about my own experience, the the apathy and the self-sabotage, which I think we can all relate to on varying degrees. I'm happy to say that the original Google list I read, uh, a lot of the traits on there, I feel like I, I checked the box in not 
embodying. Uh, but here's a new list for us. Here's a top 10 one. There's, there's top 10 toxic traits from Science of People. Playing the victim. This one's the worst, honestly. We see this shit all the time on the internet. <clears throat> uh, happy. I mean, playing the victim I is, is quite literally the opposite of extreme ownership, which I, you know, you, if you've read the book by Jocko Willink or heard of it, it's this idea of extreme ownership. Um, it's kind of the opposite of playing the victim, and I think that it's... There's no better way to live life than just to own every situation you're in because playing the victim is to lose lose game. Takes everything personally. Not at all. Couldn't be me. People pleasing. People pleasers hide their own personalities and preferences to try to get other people to like them. It's hard to trust people pleasers because they will sacrifice their own truth in pursuit of external validation. <clears throat> now, this is one I actually do struggle with. I think. And it's been an interesting seeing it play out online where <clears throat> there's a level of wanting to say and do things that um, matter to me or, you know, say and do things that I think are funny, the content that I make, I want to entertain and stuff like that. But there is a level of sometimes walking, you know, sitting on the fence because I don't like people being angry or mad at me. I just don't. And I don't think that necessarily has to be toxic in and of itself, but it's especially prescient now, like when you're online and how divided just the internet is in general. And no matter what you say, there will be somebody that takes the opposite side. And when you're somebody who doesn't, you know, like people not liking you, it can, it can affect how you, how, you know, it can affect how you act and it can affect, it can, <clears throat> it can make you act in a way that is not authentic in order to try and avoid at all costs people getting pissed at you. And I will say, this is something I've gotten a lot better at in the last decade. When I first was making content on YouTube in like 15, 16, 17, 18, it, it that was much more presence of mind for me. Um, and it wasn't even about like being canceled and whatever the fuck that whole thing is. It's just more about like, you know what? I, I, I don't really take joy in getting people pissed off, but at the same time, I want to be able to speak my mind and say things that I think are true objectively or subjectively. But it's funny too, because the flip side of that is there's, you know, you can make a career online just pissing off as many people as possible. That's like, that is now a career path is being as divisive as possible. And you will effectively garner support, support, garner support from the people that feel strongly about those issues and get just as much attention from the other camp that hates you for believing a certain thing. I wouldn't do well as that type of thing. That's why I'm not a political pundit. I just, I don't, I don't like the idea of just saying things for the sake of pissing people off or I don't know if I was saying them for the sake of, you know, I'm not afraid to say something if I truly believe it, but I do really think there's a lot of people online that specifically just, they pick these particular issues and topics and they double down on them and constantly are talking about them. And in this kind of ultimatum kind of my way or the highway type of way, just because they know it's going to get clicks and views and rage bait, et cetera. Just doesn't feel like something I'd, I'd enjoy. Entitlement, guilt tripping, creates drama, holding grudges, boundary violating, passive aggressiveness, martyrdom. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm pretty good on all of those. Not passive aggressive, martyrdom. We've all, entitlement, we already talked about that one. Uh, it goes on, this article. Not speaking out is a toxic trait. I don't know. I mean, I feel like there's definitely people that don't know how to stand up for themselves. I wouldn't put myself in that camp. But on the flip side of that, I think there's this idea that God gave us two ears and one mouth, right? There's a time to talk and there's time to listen. A lot of people should do a lot more listening than talking. But I do think there are people that should speak up sometimes that are maybe afraid to. Perfectionism, don't deal with that. Toxic positivity. Oh, man, we all know that guy, right? We all know that dude. Hey, man, it's so great, man. I know, you, I know your mom just died, but just look at it this way. It's going to be fat. No, dude, just relax. Just chill, bro. All right. Don't need it right now. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but swerve me with that shit. <clears throat> what 
working in the restaurant, there was always a couple of those that came through. And the restaurant industry is funny because it's such a nihilistic industry <laughs> that you'd have someone come through with just like this rose colored goggles, toxic positivity, and they'd last like a month before they would just be miserable, <laughs> surrounded by a bunch of nihilistic cunts. Uh, sometimes I miss the restaurant, but then after 10 seconds of thinking about it, I don't anymore. This list goes on. There's a bunch of stuff lying, insincerity, victimhood, cheating. Yeah, no, I don't struggle with that. Taking things personally, definitely don't struggle with that. I know, dude, there's, this is the strangest one, the strangest one to me, like, especially like grown adult men, just speaking from experience, like, if you're a grown adult man or like hanging out with other dudes and like you can't take a bit of a ribbing or like you can't you can't get razzed or shit on a little bit without getting bummed out about it. That's so fucking weird to me. <laughs> Why do you care? Like it's one thing, you know, and this this is in the context of like just nothing super personal. Just like I'm just thinking of an experience I had recently with somebody and it was. I was just like, man, how do you how do you let something that trivial or innocuous actually get you emotionally jarred? Toxic trait. <clears throat> Seeking the validation of others. Guilty. This is right along the lines of uh the, the whole thing I was just talking about with like not wanting to piss people off. Same idea. I think that this is another thing I've gotten better at, but uh, being a people pleaser, I think, is what we were talking about previously. These kind of go hand in hand for me. I think about this a lot too, because you know, in the in the digital age, the online, the attention economy, the likes and the views, it's it's super easy to get wrapped up in feeling validated by view count, likes, people, uh, positive comments, et cetera, and stuff like that. But the dangerous, the slippery slope is that the flip side of that is when things turn, and if your entire self worth is in this basket of this kind of validation from, you know, people you don't know, that can be a very slippery slope. So you, and granted this, you know, this could be outside. I'm just thinking of my own life, but obviously there's people that don't live their lives online who seek the validation of those, you know, people around them personally in real life. And um, I think it's, it's okay to want people to like you. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think there's people that actually are like, are on the flip side of that, that are like, their whole personality is like, oh yeah, I'm real, I'm a real dick, you know. Yeah, fuck, yeah. You like me or not, like I'm just, I'm, I am who I am. You either like me or you don't. It's like, okay, buddy, calm down. All right, like we get it. Like you're a fucking badass, and you're gonna say what you want to say. It's like that's fine if you do that, but some people really make that their whole personality. It's kind of cringe. There's nothing wrong with wanting people to like you, but it gets a little hairy when your own feelings of self worth are tied to external validation markers from whatever it may be. Your contemporaries, the other moms on the school board, your coworkers, the commenters in your comment section, the Instagram likes, like whatever. There's a million different ways and there's so many external sources of validation, I think more now than ever. And it can become very unhealthy if we're constantly looking outward for ways to give ourselves self-worth when obviously, you know, those things need to find a way to come from within. You need to find a purpose, have purpose, a goal, something you're working towards, something you can you can rely on that doesn't come from something outside of your control. Something I struggle with, something I've gotten better with, um, but will probably struggle with for the rest of my life, if I had to guess, but do what I can. Uh, judging, jealousy, ignoring self-care. Yeah, I like to do that from time to time. That's ignoring self-care. That's like the that's like the Asmund Gold fucking toxic trait of the century right now. <laughs> ignoring self-care, that's like any neck beardness. That's like the streamer specialty. Ignoring self-care. Yeah, I just uh sit in a room filled with 450 various moldy fucking to-go takeout containers roaches crawling around the room and then I just like stream all day long and make a bunch of money but streamer playbook 101 right there I I would probably be in that camp if if it wasn't for my wife she's been such a good influence on me and make sure and making sure I do things to take care of myself she schedules my haircuts for Christ's sake <laughs> she schedules my haircuts my phlebotomies uh I mean goddamn that woman 
she makes sure I'm taking care of myself via her taking care of me taking care of myself. <laughs> oh, love her to death. Being overly competitive, guilty. <laughs> yeah, not to the point where I'm going to be like a weird dad at like his kid's soccer game, but still. Anyways, scroll. There's a million in this list. Negative self-talk we talked about already. Uh, the last one I thought was oh, con the last one I thought was kind of funny was uh, vol. Or no, this wasn't the last one. Volatile, volatile exploder. <laughs> yes, sir. If I ever had a toxic trait, it's definitely being a volatile exploder. That one's uh, behind a paywall, though. But what is this? People that have unpredictable emotional responses. One second, they're calm. The next moment, they're euphoric. And the next moment, they're a volcano erupting with rage. Now, I've spoken about this many times, but I am a bit of a volatile exploder when it comes uh, to video games, competitive video games. I don't know why. Outside of that, I'm the complete opposite. I'm cool as a cucumber. But I have a bit of a rage issue around innocuous, zero consequence video game outcomes. So fucking dumb. But I've been like that since I was a kid. I still game with some of my buddies that I grew up with. You know, we're going on 40 now and we'll game on Discord. And they still make fun of me. Because <clears throat> when I was a kid, like 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, they'd be like afraid to sit next to me because if I lost or I'd get, you know something would happen in a competitive game. This is on like Nintendo or Sega Genesis. I would like get pissed and fucking Charlie horse him in the thigh as hard as I could, or like shut the fucking game up. It was the stupidest shit. Not as bad now as I'm older, but <laughs> definitely a volatile exploder. <laughs> uh, this one is the best. The last one that was on the list, it was uh toxic aloofness. And I, I saw this. I was like, Oh my God, that's the funniest shit I've ever heard. But this is so me though. Toxically aloof people maintain an emotional distance. They always seem disinterested or detached. You can never feel too close to them. And if you have toxically aloof person in your life, you'll probably feel constantly undervalued by them. Now, when I say this is so me, I don't mean all the time, but I do. It's easy for me to have that head in your cloud syndrome. Where I struggle with this the most is when I'm leaving my office. If I'm like have my head, if I'm doing work on something and I'm in it and it's like, fuck, I'm not done yet, but it's, you know, it's five o'clock and it's my normal time to leave and go home, be a dad, be a husband, eat dinner, spend time with the family. Sometimes it's hard for me to shut off that work mode and I become, and I become toxically aloof. And it's like, I'm there, but my head is still attached to what I was working on. And I hate when that happens because there's nothing worse than being, you know, being there at family time and just being present, but not being present. That's something I work on a lot that I know that I struggle with. And it's not all the time. I am pretty good. I oftentimes will just leave my phone in another room or something during that time. But this idea of, you know, having a toxically aloof person in your life, you'll probably feel constantly undervalued by them. That is such an easy trap to fall into, I think, in a relationship or in a marriage where you get co you get comfortable, you get complacent, you're constantly just toxically aloof, whether it's on your phone, scrolling Instagram, whatever. And it's like, it's so easy to just never be present with your partner, even though you're with each other all the time. You're like always together, but never together kind of thing. It's really fucked up. And I think about it a lot. And I try to make sure there's some intention in some specific times where it's like, you know, you got to be intentional about it now because it's easy to just be constantly thinking about the next thing. Sometimes my wife and I like will do, we'll play cribbage, you know, instead of like sitting on the couch watching a show and like, scrolling IG and sharing memes, like, you know, typical talks, or typical, uh, typical couples meme, uh, we'll play like some cribbage or something where it's like, Hey, you're playing a card game. You're talking to each other. You're engaging with each other. And I love that shit. And it's not all the time. You know, you're still going to do the normal couple shit with the phones and whatever you're together all the time. That's fine. But it is easy to fall into this trap of constant toxic aloofness. <laughs> And so that's something I try to I try to be very, very intentional about in how I uh, assuage the aloofness when it's time to be present. And I know this is probably tough for everybody, but I feel like for me sometimes it being someone who's required to be, you know, so much of my life happens online and on a phone. <clears throat> um, it's a little bit harder to turn that off sometimes, but. I work on it. That's these are my confessions and I'm on the way. 
Uh, not confessions, just a little bit of me talking about some things that I, I guess, struggle, I guess is the word that I think about. There's uh, obviously areas of my life where I think I'm doing pretty well in, and then there's constantly things I could be doing much better in. Um, and it helps me to talk about it. And I hope that some of you guys listening might have gained a little bit of insight, A, into what makes me tick, if that's of interest to you, and B, into some of these things that might uh, be present in your life that you didn't really think of that you might have a new perspective on. And that's all I'm ever trying to do is to have awareness and perspective on my life, things that are affecting me positively and negatively, and what I can best do to mitigate the things that are having a negative out, you know, a negative effect or creating negative outcomes in my life. And that, I guess, is what this conversation was about today. And I'd love to hear some of your toxic traits. If you leave a comment down below, I'll read them. I'll respond to them. As always, I appreciate you dearly for listening. Hope you found something valuable. And I'll see you in the next episode of Decently Indecent. Thanks for listening. Peace.